In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you for joining us online again. Um, today, we're actually going to reflect on the gospel from uh, Mark chapter 2. This is the first Sunday of the Blessed Month of Baba. And in this month, we're going to focus on repentance and how repentance leads to salvation uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ and his work. And we see the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially in today's gospel. Um, hopefully, you read it. Uh, before you logged on. It's, it's chapter 2 of Mark, uh, verses 1 through 12. So if you haven't read it, and you have a Bible next to you, um, you might want to take it out. Again, chapter 2 of Mark, verses 1 through 12, and you can follow along. And we'll kind of kind of take it part by part. And so uh, today we see our Lord's power over sin. In verse 10 of today's passage, it says that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive. Sin. And so um, if you know this, this should not be a, a, a new passage for you, right? Uh, this is the famous passage when the four friends carry the paralyzed man to Christ in hopes of healing him. You know, maybe they heard how Christ healed the blind and cleansed the lepers and cured the paralyzed. And he even raised the dead. And at this point, you know, Christ is a charismatic preacher. He's a miracle worker. And perhaps these men hoped and believed that he could do the same for their friend. And so they go to the home where our Lord is staying and they encounter a huge crowd that surrounds the house and it's not allowing them to pass through the entranceway. So undiscouraged, they think of a way outside the box to overcome this obstacle and they struggle to carry their paralyzed friend to the top of the roof. They dig a hole through the ceiling and they lower their friend right in front of Christ. And the people are amazed and they think like the, 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 the boldness of these men to destroy a roof and lower their friend down to the feet of Christ. You know, the, the, at this point, the crowd is waiting for a miracle and our Lord doesn't disappoint. But our Lord does something that shocks them. Instead of immediately healing the paralytic, he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. My son, your sins are forgiven. Why would our Lord say that to a man who can't walk, your sins are forgiven. You know, was it possible that this man felt that God has cursed him with a paralysis? Was the man paralyzed because, because of some sin that he or maybe his parents had committed? Because that would be the common thought and the idea among many people in the crowd. So obviously when our Lord said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Some people were shocked that the audacity of Christ who can forgive sin except for God alone? This, this, this preacher is speaking blasphemy, offering the forgiveness of sins. When a man seeks healing, it, it's confusing, right? It's shocking. Um, so ultimately, what does forgiving sins have to do with sickness and healing? This is, this is the, the center point of the, of the story from today. This is at the heart of our Lord's ministry on earth. Our Lord came not to simply just make people physically well, right? Of course, he did do that. But even after a miraculous healing, the same people that were even healed, they eventually died. The crucial problem for humanity is not a sickness. It's not some physical ailment, but it's sin, it's death. And so through sin, humanity turns away and they separate themselves from God. This is a departure from the source of life, which ultimately leads to death. Our sin has distorted the divine image of God within us. And so for ultimate healing to occur, our Lord goes to the root of the problem. He goes to our sin. By offering forgiveness, he offers the ultimate holistic healing. So let's go back to the scene. In the midst of this scene, we are witnessing an amazing story, a story of friendship. And we see the love of God. The four men have been, have been coming in to carry their paralyzed friend. We don't know exactly how far they traveled, but we can be sure that it's been a struggle to carry their friend the whole way. These men showed a lot of love for their friend, but their love would be tested even further, right? When they arrived at the scene, they found that there was so many people that there was just no way to bring the poor, uh, sick friend to our Lord Jesus Christ. At least there was no conventional way to do it. See, one of the beautiful things that we learn from the lives of the saints in our church is that there's no like cookie cutter way 
um, to live the life of a saint or to become a saint. Each one of the saints is unique. And while they all have certain aspects of their struggles in common, each one must find their own, maybe sometimes unconventional ways to find our Lord Jesus Christ. And the four men did that. They decided that if there was just no way through the doors or through the windows of the house, they would have to look up, right? And they decided that their best course of action would be to come from the ceiling by uncovering part of the roof of the house. Of course, <clears throat> at this time, the, the construction is very different than what we know nowadays. But the church fathers uh, contemplate on the roof and they give some nice uh, ideas about the roof. The roof is high above all things. And the scripture uses this analogy just as it uses mountains sometimes to say that this is how that we should be in our Christian life. We should look up. We should ascend. We should be thinking of the spiritual things, not of the carnal and daily worldly things. We should elevate our minds. We should contemplate on the pure things. We should think of the things that God wishes us to know. And so these men got on the roof. So of course, it was a, a practical act to get on the roof so they could break the tiles or the roof tiles or whatever to, to let them down. It was actually a very genius way to do it. The men did that, right? They, they hoisted their friend up on high and they uncovered a spot on the roof to let them down to meet our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as important, uh, this is important because the man who was paralyzed, he never said a word to Christ. It was our Lord who looked on the faith of the friends and said, son, your sins are forgiven. It reminds us that our faith is powerfully beneficial to others. In fact, if you think about it, we just had a baptism yesterday. It's exactly what parents do when we baptize infants, right? We take the faith of their parents and the godparents, and we ask our Lord Jesus Christ to see that faith and to count it towards the one who is brought to him, right? The, which is his body, the, the church. So if the Lord Jesus acted this way for this man, can there be any doubt that the Lord will accept our faith as well? This is why we baptize, uh, one, of the, one of the contemplations on why, we why we're okay with baptizing the infants. And so in, this, in the course of the story, something amazing happens. Initially, uh, the Lord does not heal the paralyzed man of his paralysis. And you know, you might find that a bit strange. If you put a man in his condition, in his paralyzed condition, in front of a group of doctors, and then we ask the doctors, what's wrong with this man in your opinion, right? I'm sure the physicians and the doctors would tell us <clears throat> that the problem with this man is his physical ailment, right? It's his being paralyzed. And yes, this is, this is true, but it's not the problem according to our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Christ, the most important issue that needed to be addressed was the underlying sins that this man was carrying. And he begins by healing the man's soul. How? By granting the forgiveness of sins. And so as we are in, in the beginning of our second month of the Coptic year, maybe you made New Year's resolutions for the Coptic year. And, and there's another time for that when we talk about January 1st. But we are in the second month. We just started today of the, of the second month of the Coptic year. We're reminded that physical strength and physical healings means very little if we are spiritually paralyzed. If we would all be spiritually paralyzed, you know, th this would be the case for all of us, if not for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ towards each one of us. We experience this power of forgiveness of sins in baptism, and we continue to experience it through the sacrament of confession and life of the church. So wholeness and health and sanity start with the forgiveness of sins. In our chaotic world with a pandemic looming over us and all these kind of things that are going on, I know all of us are struggling with homeschool and working from home and, and all these kind of things, but this, this healing starts with the forgiveness of sins. And so through our repentance, through our struggle, if it's been too long to see your father confession, we need to make that a priority. Um, we need to be purified from our sinful habits and our passions so that we can fully participate in the healing and the forgiveness of sins that God provides. 
it's a strong for, reminder for each one of us that we should be struggling to repent in a more serious and a more um, directed way. This repentance is the foundation of our, of our path to real and actual knowledge of God that comes through his grace. And so I, I don't want to miss this point of talking about another aspect uh, of this gospel passage. And I think it's a, it's a crucial point. It's friendship. Friendship, the true friendship that leads us to Christ. Our journey to Christ is helped by our friends. And unfortunately, it can also be hurt by them as well. So what's the characteristics of a good friend? And we're never too old to hear this. We're never too old. We, sometimes we think the friendship talk is just for the kids. And I made my, my peace with it and I have my friends and it's not gonna change me as I'm an adult, but no, what are the characteristics of a good friend? Good friends are consistent. Good friends are reliable. And the friendship does not depend on a situation. Um, good friends are fun, yes, and they're honest and they know how to keep confidence and they're trustworthy. Friendship, good friends are forgiving and they have our best interests in mind. They're both good listeners and good advisors. Good friends have good morals and good values, and they encourage us to stay out of trouble. And so that's a good friend, right? So let's, let's take it up a level. What's a good Christian friend, right? A good Christian friend is not only uh, important to have good friends, but it's important to have good Christian friends. A Christian friend prays for one another. And they encourage us and they encourage us to worship. And when our faith is shaken, as it happens to all of us occasionally, right? They help us build up our faith again. The Christian friend holds us accountable um, and they discourage us from non-Christian behaviors, right? And they encourage us in Christian behaviors. All of us need good friends, but I think a point that sometimes we forget is all of us need to be good friends, and to be good Christian friends to others, even those who are non-Christian. It's important that each of us learn how to listen, how to keep confidence, right? Not to gossip, not if I hear something that somebody is struggling with that I share it with the whole world. No, we have to learn how to keep confidence and how to encourage one another without being critical, right? If, if I'm out with a group of friends of mine and it's a Wednesday night or a Friday night and we're supposed to be fasting, and I decide to order the bean burrito, right? I'm not gonna cast judgment on those who are um, getting the chicken nuggets, right? That's not for me. That's not my place to judge. I can't be over, overly critical of those that are around me, but we have to learn how to give advice and when we should just listen. And so the true meaning of friendship is to lead others to the gospel, directly or indirectly, whether they're aware of it or not. Um, one of my favorite quotes from, I think it's St. John Chrysostom. He says, preach always and when necessary, speak. I'll say that one more time. Preach always and when necessary, speak. Again, we're, our, our, our true task of being a, a good Christian friend is to lead people to the gospel, directly or indirectly, whether they know it or whether they don't. Um, when our Lord in verse five of today's passage said, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. If they don't read the gospel, if the people that are around us don't read the gospel, they read the gospel in you. If they don't ever have an icon in their house, or if they've never been to the church where they've seen an icon of Christ, they see Christ in you. Our St. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. And so true friends are my friends. We have to ask ourselves some difficult questions. Are my friends leading us to Christ or away from Christ? Sometimes that's the most unpopular question that we can reflect on. I don't wanna be outside the group. I don't wanna be outside the social, the social circle. But are my friends actually leading me to Christ or am I fooling myself? Are they pulling me away from Christ? If, you don't, if I don't want to go to church, do they encourage me? If I feel like I don't want to pray, I don't want to fast, I don't want to go to confession, are they carrying me as if I'm sick and leading me to Christ, to church? 
You know, you should confess, you should change, you should not cheat, you should not lie, right? We should be that voice of reason. Do I feel embarrassed to correct others? Or do I get angry when others are, are correcting me? No, none of us, um, none of us are perfect, uh, but uh, we have to choose the friends that will perfect you, right? We have to choose the friends that won't hurt you. Um, it's not the faith of the paralytic that, that affects healing. His own healing is the faith of others, especially the four men. Um, so how many of us believe in the power of faith and the power of prayer to move our loving Lord Jesus Christ to take pity on those that are in our worlds, right? How many of us are bringing people to God's house? Maybe not physically bringing them, but I mean, even our own family. Um, and are we breaking down every barrier to get to that church, to, to get to Christ? Or are we making excuse after excuse? You know, not all of us uh, may have physical uh, ailments or physical harm to us, but all of us at one point in our lives will suffer from spiritual illnesses. So who's going to bring us if we can't bring ourselves? Who is going to pray for us when we are too weak or depressed to pray for ourselves? Our Lord Jesus Christ asked, he said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So we learn from today's passage, even salvation itself depends on our relationships. We can't just be hermits. Sometimes our salvation is dependent on our family and it's dependent on the church. Imagine Imagine we had hundreds of people in the church and it's packed like we used to be, right? And somebody starts to vandalize the roof of the church and they make a hole in the, in the middle of the church. And all we hear is like hammers and saws and, and they lower this man down in the middle of the church and everybody saw it and everybody noticed it. Like it wasn't done in some remote corner of the church. Everybody noticed it. It was in front of everybody. And what would you expect to hear? What we expect to hear is our Lord Jesus Christ saying, well, I can see your faith, therefore your sins are forgiven. But it's not that he would say that to the individual. No, he doesn't say that. He says, you have faith, therefore you're, you are forgiven your sins. This is what we think that we would hear our Lord say. But our Lord uses the plural. He says in the gospel, and when he saw their faith, their faith, more than one person, when he saw their faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. Has it ever occurred to you that your sins may be forgiven, not just in the basis of your own personal faith, right? Of your own personal relationship with God, but that your sins and, and can be forgiven because God sees your faith and your spouse's faith and your children's faith and your friend's faith and seeing their faith and the whole community linked together, seeing their faith, he looks at you and he says, your sins are forgiven. And so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thought. It's an encouraging thought that we're not saved in isolation. We're not saved in solo. We are saved as a community, right? We are saved in community. And so just some concluding thoughts. Our salvation from sins it's not just our faith alone, but it's a whole network of holy people, our friends who are lowering us down, metaphorically speaking, to put us right at the feet of Christ. If, if you are forgiven your sins, you have to thank those friends and those family members who dragged you kicking and screaming to the presence of Christ. I encourage every family during this pandemic to really enhance your home church, even if the kids are reluctant and the kids are giving you a hard time, we have to find a way to break those barriers, to bring them to Christ, to bring ourselves to Christ. Those people who have shown you who he is, those people who have prayed for you, those people who they themselves have faith in you. Salvation is in the community. And that's one of the things that's taught to us through, the, through this uh, gospel passage today. But... <clears throat> We can't be brought near to our Lord without first removing the, the roof tiles, right? We, we have to be able to humble ourselves. Being let down through the roof means to be uh, humbled in front of God. And that 
we can draw near to him and ask for and receive healing. So the bed of the paralytic represents the body that is um, pursuing fleshly desires and clings to sinful actions. And so uh, we pray that God may grant uh, that we labor, that we can pass all the difficulties in our lives, that we can pass all, all our frustrations and all the distractions and all the sinfulness, all of our bad habits that might be difficult to change, but not impossible. And all that crowd that we passed, that we labor past all of that. And we set our minds above. We set our minds on holiness. We set our minds on the purpose of life, which is to imitate um, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks for our illnesses when they turn us back to God. It can be an opportunity whenever we get sick that it reminds us to have a heart towards God. And let us humble ourselves before our Lord through fasting and confession and glory be to God forever. Amen. And so I want to open it up to any questions. Um,